Ladies and gentlemen, we have a fun one for you today. On today's episode, we are joined by the bait man himself, Kevin Baxter. Kevin is an encyclopedia of baits, and he's been around the industry for quite a while, so we chat with Kevin about some of his favorite retro baits, some overrated baits, and I ask him for his unfiltered opinion on my favorite baits. All that and more in this episode of Tackle Talk. Hello, everybody. I'm Bill Dance, and you're listening to Tackle Talk. Welcome to the Tackle Talk Podcast, brought to you by American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors, world-class fishing gear, unmatched personal service. Now, here's your host, Andrew Hayes. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Tackle Talk Podcast. As always, we are brought to you by the fine folks over at American Legacy Fishing and Outdoors. Now right now, over at ALF, there are a few sales that you need to know about. One of them is their super secret Halloween sale. Now, I guess it's probably not really a secret anymore because I'm telling you about it, but it is a secret in the sense that they aren't allowed to advertise what the deal is. There's rules about this kind of stuff, especially blanket discounts for certain brands. But if you email secret at AmericanLegacyFishing.com, if you email them anything, you can send them a meme, you can send them a blank email with nothing in the body, it doesn't matter. If you email secret at AmericanLegacyFishing.com. You are going to immediately get an email back that will have a coupon code in it that is a deal that they are not allowed to advertise. So go check that out. Again, secret at AmericanLegacyFishing.com. It takes two seconds. Email it and see what that deal is. Now, the other deal we have going for you is 20% off Jacob Wheeler's Signature Series rods. Again, that deal is just for Tackle Talk listeners, and it is good until the end of the month. I know that's coming up fast, but if you've ever wanted one of those signature rods from maybe one of the most dominant anglers on the planet today and just happens to be the guest of our last episode, you can go check out those at AmericanLegacyFishing.com and use code JW. JW, like Jacob Wheeler, 20 at checkout for 20% off. And as always, if you need any other rods, reels, line, lures, whatever you need, and it's not on sale, you can use code TACKLETALK10. All one word over at AmericanLegacyFishing.com. That will save you 10% off your entire order. Some exclusions apply, but not many. Again, 10% with code TACKLETALK10. All right, so there's some savings to start off the episode, thanks to American Legacy Fishing, and now let's get to the main part of the episode. And this is going to be a fun one, because usually when I talk to guests, it's like my first time sitting down and talking with them. If it's a pro angler, if it's a biologist, if it's a YouTuber, whoever it is, I'm usually talking to them for the first time on the episode. I don't usually know these people ahead of time, but that's not the case today. I've known the bait man for quite a while now. We've been introduced through a mutual friend a couple years back, and he's one of those people that I really respect respect his opinion on anything and everything baits. So we talk about a ton in this episode. We chat about old baits, new baits, my favorite baits, Kevin's favorite baits, but obviously it's a short format, so we don't get into a ton of detail on this. We just kind of scratch the surface on some of these topics. And if you like Kevin, if you like what you hear, you can go over and you can check out his YouTube channel called The Baitman TV all one word, and you can go watch his videos and some of his old streams where he is just talking about anything and everything bass lures. He is literally an encyclopedia when it comes to baits and lures throughout the years. It's awesome. So today's a little change of pace. It's a little bit more laid back, a little bit more informal than it usually is here at Tackle Talk, but it's a fun way to just sit back and talk baits with someone that seemingly has used every bait on the planet and what he likes and doesn't like. So let's get right into it. Here is our conversation with Kevin, the bait man, Baxter. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are joined by one of those guys I would probably call one of the old heads of Bass Fishing YouTube. It is the bait man himself, Kevin Baxter. Kevin, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, thanks, man. Makes me feel good considering I had a (laughs) birthday coming up next month. I feel real old now. (laughs) <laughs> but you are. You're one of the OGs that I used to watch on YouTube and I used to check out your stuff. You're very informative on the bait side of things. And like when I get home from work or whatever and I just want to like turn on YouTube and actually watch something where I can take some info away from and not just some kid fishing an HOA pond. So before we get into a bunch of bait talk, which obviously is why we wanted to have you on, is you know 
20,000 times more about baits than I probably ever will in my life. But before we get there, you've done some cool stuff in the past. You did some filming for some TV shows. You're doing some stuff now. So I don't know if I've ever actually heard your full fishing story of how you got into it and where you've all been. Yeah. So it's kind of wild. Uh, you know, I filmed for Matt Robertson and Mark Menendez on the side. Matt's pretty, you know, it's a small, small window there, but, uh, when we get to it, we can. And, uh, Mark Menendez has a local TV show here called MM Bass TV. We put all the episodes on YouTube afterwards. Um, been doing that for about three years, but it's kind of weird how I really got started in the industry. Uh, I worked for a guy named Mike Otten, who's an OG bass master guy. Um, he had this little show called Classic Patterns, and he also filmed uh, Angler on Tour with Ohio's own Joe Thomas. And, uh, sure. I, I believe that was actually the first kind of vlog uh, that was out there for fishing. A lot of people don't remember, it, but Joe and, and Mike, they filmed every tournament. You saw the ups and the downs. So I met Mike at a Bassmaster Classic. I was uh, in between my junior and senior year of high school. He was banging his laptop, couldn't get something to work. I walked over there and was like, hey, man, what, what's going on? He told me, I'm like, oh, you just press this key and that key. And he looked at me like, dude, you know about computers? I'm like, oh, yeah. So we formed a friendship from them, and I graduated. And he said, hey, come work for me. So I worked for him. And I was just the guy that took the footage off the tape and put it on a computer. Because back then, we didn't have SD cards and stuff. So I, I logged footage. So imagine your day job for eight hours a day. You're taking this video of Kevin Van Dam, Mike Iaconelli, Kelly Jordan, Gerald Swin, the whole Lucky Craft crew, and you're getting to watch every bit of it, and you're seeing all the behind-the-scenes stuff, all the tips, the tricks. Some of it's going on TV. Sometimes I'm like, don't, don't put this on TV. And uh, so I learned a lot from there, and uh, I worked for Mike for a couple years. Then Pradco came along, which uh, people following the show, Pradco owns Bomber, Smithwick, Yum, Booyah, and said and offered Mike a general manager position for a company called Commonwealth Productions, which basically does all of Pradco's hunting and fishing shows. And I was working in a little tackle store uh, before that, and uh, I took that full time. And man, I ran with it. I basically did all the classic patterns um, TV shows for uh, Pradco. Uh, did a hunting show uh, called Scent Locks High Places and also worked on The Hit List, which had Andy Morgan, Gerald Swindle. It's one thing to fish with those guys. It's another thing to hang in a deer stand uh, with them. Uh, they're a little bit imagine. different. A <laughs> little bit different. I don't mean bad. Uh, their intensity is is totally different because they don't get to hunt all the time. Their schedules are so busy. So they're all about, you know, putting one down. And uh, it was a really cool deal, but I learned so much not just about baits and fishing, but I learned their personalities and I learned a lot of behind the scenes that most people don't know about, but uh, it was a good experience. And then, uh, you know, I did some off and on things for a friend owned a, a store called the cabin bait and tackle. His name's Ronnie Critchlow worked there for a long time. He said, Hey, dude, my website sucks. Let's get some sales, you know, social media, didn't take me, but about a year and a half, had that banging and started kind of my own gig with somebody else. And it worked out for a while. And, and uh, you know, to be honest, uh, I make a Luca bond now, which is I work in a factory, got me a good union job, make a lot more money. I love fishing and all that stuff. But, you know, all the experience just come from being in the industry. And it all really started by meeting the right guy at the Bassmaster Classic. Is uh, Mike related to Todd at all? No, get that okay. question a lot, but they're not related. Okay, interesting. It's not a very common last name, at least around yeah, here. Yeah, so I had a stream, and you can link my channel or whatever, uh, with Mike Otten here about six months ago, kind of the first time he's really come out in, in years, and uh, he's doing really well. And uh, don't ask him about forward facing sonar because he has no <laughs> clue what it is or anything. He just goes fishing. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's pretty much me too. And I would honestly probably say the majority of people that listen to the show probably fall in that same boat. I mean, you're big time, man. There's no time how many people are going to be listening to this thing. And I think your audience is really good. They're like keyed in on what's good, what's not. And when someone's trying to push something and I try to be no BS, obviously I have favorites. 
uh, whether it's old school stuff, new school stuff. But I always say I really try not to just sell somebody something to be selling it to them. Like if I am not confident about using it, whether it's on a lake, a river, a pond, I just don't talk about it. I'm not going to bash companies or anything. I always get the, why don't you use Guggen Squad stuff? Nothing gets those guys. They make way more money than me. I just got my own preferences. Well, and I think you hit on one of the reasons why I love watching your stuff. And I think a lot of people probably like watching your stuff too. It's kind of the same thing with what I try to do here, which is it's so hard to find people now that will truly, truly be unbiased and try to show you everything. And they'll talk about different brands and they'll talk about, you know, different reels and rods and baits and just not who they're getting paid for. You have these guys that are so disingenuous, they'll blur out the the bag of bait they're using because they're not getting paid by it. And it's like, that's what's, I don't know. That's what I miss about some of the YouTube and the stuff of five, six, seven, eight years ago before it really got as bad as it is now. It's like you could you could watch people's content. And you could soak up a bunch of information and they would talk about mm-hmm. not they wouldn't just say bladed jigs. Right. They'd say jackhammer or they'd say thunder cricket or they'd say whatever they were using. And now it's you can't get anybody to shoot you straight and give you a bunch of information. That's what I like about you is you tune into one of your streams. You'll hear 30 40 50 different brands and different baits and models and sizes and things like that you don't really discriminate i know you have some that you do like to work with and some you favor a little bit more than others but i I had someone tell me the other day they're like i don't have a problem with people having bias as long as their bias comes from a true place and not somebody sliding you a check to say what you don't believe yeah uh so you know i work with six cents fishing uh Casey Sopsack, not only is uh, he a good dude, he's a friend of mine. And we've had this conversation many times, and he's never once got on to me for mentioning XYZ brand. Uh, And he said, that's what makes you authentic. You know, if you say the provoke jerkbait's a good jerkbait because it does this, this, and this. And then you also talk about Mega Bass is a great jerkbait. It does this, this, and that. All that does is legitimate. It legitimize, ooh, that's a big word, what you're talking about. Um, because I'm not gonna just say, hey, this is the best jerk bait in the world because XYZ brand makes it. You got to go buy some. I think it's the best jerk bait, and I hate the term the best. I see so many videos, the best crank baits, the best five fall baits. There's really not a best, it's truly what works for you in the right situation. I mean, there's times, uh, man, I, I do love that six cents provoke, but there's times, man. I have to pick up Strike King or I have to pick up uh, a a Jackal Rearrange. It's a great bait or a Mega Bass because whatever those bass are doing or the conditions, I have to adapt well. And if you keep a real narrow mind, especially single branded, it can really hurt you as a fisherman. Yeah, it's funny you say that. So I don't want to give too much away because I think it'll probably be the episode after this one airs, but I'm going to do a, I don't want to call it an unboxing one because I hate that word seems silly and two because I'm an audio yeah. format, but I'm going to be doing a review of one of my first purchases from Sixth Sense and uh, it'll be pretty cool. I'm, I'm pretty lucky you guys did a really cool sack of, again, I don't want to give too much away, but I got a ton of value for what I paid for. Yeah, so that's a good way to become a bait junkie really quick. Uh, obviously, Sixth Sense has some great sales like that. Uh, they put together a lot of, you know, like pond fishing kits, deep cranking kits. Heck, they had a Bateman box and one thing. It, it's my fault for not keeping falling up, but uh, whether it's Six Cents or other companies, those those are ways to really get a collection going. And sometimes you're going to get baits. You, you're like, man, I, I couldn't afford that. Those two swim baits right there, most guys at retail are kind of going back off. If you can get a really good deal, maybe it's not for you. You can still pawn it off, sell it, and, and put a little cash back in your pocket. Um, I'm a tackle warehouse junkie. It, it's it'd be crazy if tackle warehouse did a mystery box who knows what what you would see in that stuff well and uh i saw one of the uh baits that came that too i for the love of me i can't remember what the bait's called but it's like a jointed it's got one single joint in it and it's kind of like a wake bait like it, i think it dives like one to three maybe oh yeah the um, speed wake and it came in jaint juice so yeah so that's that's my color uh, the story behind that is long before i met my wife i was dating this girl and she was cool. Nothing bad here. We went into a sporting goods store here in Paducah. Uh, it was called Don's Sporting Goods. And I was fishing a tournament the next morning. I was taking her out to the movies. I was like, I really need to get a couple rattle traps. This is the spring. There's a color I was looking for called Root Beer. It's RT315, if you guys ever want to look it up. And uh, 
they were out. And she said, well, what about this one? This one's really pretty. And it was sour grape chartreuse, purple back. I said, yeah, I'll get a couple. So anyway, next morning, you know, they were in my truck. I was like, you know, I'm going to tie this thing on. So I, the water was a little milky, kind of dirty. I'm with the guy and we run about an hour and a half. My third cast, I caught a five pounder. I was like, all right. And we caught five fish that day and I boated all five and they're all on that sour grape rattle trap. From then on, if somebody makes something in chartreuse purple, I buy it. And, you know, Six Cents has some great colors. Casey's designed 90% of them. And about two years ago, we we're talking. I said, man, you really need a chartreuse and purple, uh, you know, in a jerk bait, you know, a table rock color. That's a big seller everywhere. And from my retail experience, a lot of people go to buy a jerk bait. They can't figure out what color. They'll go to that table rock shako. And uh, he, he mails me a couple samples. And I told him how I wanted it. I wanted it different. I didn't want the school bus yellow. I wanted like a, a matte kind of yellow, almost a green with a metallic purple back. And I'm like, yeah. dude, this is it. And he said, well, what do we call it? Table rock? And I said, and I said man, uh, I got this saying. I always say I caught a jaint, which is giant bass. And uh, because I'm from Kentucky, sometimes it sounds like it's a giant. I said, jaint. And uh, I said, how about jaint juice? He said, dude killer perfect and so they put it in the line of about everything out there you know a lot of people buy it just because of me but it's always kind of rewarding when i get randomly tagged on instagram or facebook and someone tags me said dude caught it on the jank juice because all that just tells me you know it's a proven color it works random question how did you get the name Bateman? all right so i'm working in a tackle shop in a fletcher shyrock uh comes in and Fletcher is a super nice dude to me. Uh, he had his girlfriend with him. And this was about two months before the Elite Series gets there on Kentucky Lake. This is probably in 2016 or so. Okay. And so I just let him do his thing. You know, I, I'm not into like hound dogging pros or anything like that. So I'm letting him do his thing. I'm in the back working on the internet. And he just kind of slides in my door. He's like, hey, man, I need some uh, help with this, this spoon. He goes, what kind of hooks do you use on it? So I was like, all right. So I go out there and I'm showing him different treble hooks and the ones I use and stuff like that. And why he's like, man, you know a lot about this stuff. And then we get to talking about crankbaits and ledge fishing. And uh, he's like, dude, you know more about tackle than anybody I've ever been around. He said, you're, he said, you're the bait man. I said, like, I laughed. I was like, yeah, you know, I, and I just started kind of streaming from my home on my kitchen table. And I was getting like 40, 50 people on Facebook. And I was telling him about it. He said, dude, you need to create a page on Facebook and just call it Kevin the Bateman Baxter or whatnot. He said, I promise it to take off. I was like, yeah, well, I'm a nobody. He's like, yeah, but you got you to build a brand, man. You got to build a brand for yourself. He's like, you're so knowledgeable. Well, I started one. And I started doing more live streams and stuff like that. And I would do them from the tackle shop. Then after the event on Kentucky Lake, you know, Fletcher come up to me, give me a high five and, and say, Hey man, uh, some of that stuff you told me about those baits, that's dude, you are legitimately the bait man. And he's a really nice guy. And by that time, my page had kind of taken off and I started putting a few videos on YouTube. Um, and they did pretty well. It's kind of funny. Me and Ben Milliken started a YouTube channel within weeks of each other. In the first month they had 1500 subscribers. I'll never forget Ben texting me. It's like, dude, You'll be at a hundred thousand at this pace in like a year and a half. Uh, I'm at maybe 18,000 and Ben's like near 500,000. So consistency is a huge thing, but I got a total different audience, not to take away from those guys that are really grinding and doing an awesome job. Uh, I really like the 20 or 18,000 guys I got. They're all kind of in my niche. Like you said before, I don't do pond jumping videos. I like to go fish ponds. And now that my son likes to fish and play with baits, we'll definitely do a few, but I'm not in the fishing challenges and stuff like that. I just enjoy sitting down on my time, firing up the webcam, doing a little stream and talk about, you know, top water baits or balsa crank baits, shaky heads, you know, stuff that works, you know, things I own um, that I've caught fish on. And that's just how it's going to be for me. I, I like going to tackle shops and stuff like that, but, I'm not in YouTube to get rich. I mean, I make more money at my real job. Yeah. Okay. So obviously you're the bait man. Let's talk baits. Let's get into this. Sure. The first thing I wanted to talk about is 
I would call them retro baits, I guess. Not like, I know we've talked about this before, not the wooden whittled creek chub that you find at the antique flea market that's been yeah. there for 350 years. But like back when you first started fishing or back like baits that were maybe out a little bit before you started fishing, what are some of those favorite retro baits that you have that either A, aren't available anymore or B, aren't available in the iteration that they were back then? Yeah, there's a lot of, it, it's kind of weird you say that. I feel like right now in the industry, uh, there's a lot of people that are going back to the 90s. They're going yeah. to look for that stuff that when they grew up, it worked and they totally forgot about it because there's so many new baits. Swim baits are so hype and all this stuff. We're going back to maybe get an edge. Like, hey, let's go throw these baits that we forgot about because no one's throwing them now. But uh, yeah, I'm totally into that, that 90s, early 2000s stuff. Um, top of my head, I, I'm a big fan of the bomber flat eight. They still make them. They just come out with new colors. They look good, but those old school build ants bombers where you had the, the chartreuse purple coach dog, and then you had the ones with Mark Davis's signature on them. Those are big time for me. There's just something different about those. Any of the old Pradco stuff that they, they had a pro autograph series of baits. And, yeah. and I remember Kmart had them, Walmart, uh, and they had Van Dam on a Rogue. A lot of people forgot about KVD was with Pratco. He was on a Rogue and a Long A. And Mark Soson, big saltwater guy. Denny Brower, Larry Nixon, uh, all those guys. I like those old school pro autograph series baits. And one time you could sell them on eBay, make 25, 30 bucks a piece. But everybody kind of found out and the market got flooded. That's, you know, that's a whole series of baits I kind of collect. But I fish with like the Zell Rowland Spooks. They have three trebles. It's hard to find a Zara spook with three trebles. So a little bit of bait modification. You have an awesome topwater bait that guys kind of forgot about. Um, I'm, I'm big into jackal stuff. I know that's not necessarily old, but one of the best topwaters ever made, in my opinion, is a bow stick. They don't make it no more. Uh, the Bling 55 was an awesome little bait. It's not balsa, but has a little knocker in it. They re they come back out with it, but I still like the old school ones. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of stuff like that. Even in getting the plastics, like Reaction Innovations, they got a bunch of old school stuff. They don't make anymore. The screwed up jig head that was the first shaky head I really used, and it had that little bitty screw in there, but had a really sharp hook. I think it was an owner. And man, I caught so many fish on those, and I'm out. I've got like two left. So if you're listening to this podcast <laughs> and you got some screwed up jig heads slide into my dms um, i'm not gonna slide it, get you some money um the original vixen everybody talks about the og vixen i mean mm -hmm. going a hot take here i've got some of the new gens i would not pay 150 bucks for the old ones unless you're just straight up collecting if you're did fishing they, did, they got it pretty right yeah if you're fishing yeah. the new gens fine i mean i've caught fish on it but the squeaky dolphin buzz bait they used to make you can't find anywhere now that's that's one that it's legit. I, I would pay 60, 70 bucks for that to fish with. To fish with. there's not a lot of stuff I buy that I just collect unless it's like old school balsa cranks or something that's got some personal meaning to me. If I'm buying it, I have a plan to fish it. What was it about the squeaky dolphin that you go nuts for? So number one, it's uh it's got a rivet built into it. So the the way the wire, the top arm goes through the blade there's actually a rivet there inside that so after wear and tear that rivet really starts wallowing out you get a lot of squeak you get some just random no noises in there and it's not oversized it's just the right size where if a fish comes up and grabs it he's probably gonna get all hooked it, it's, it casts good it runs good and it's got it's got the right noise to it didn't it have some sort of little like I don't know if it was a bearing or a ball or something that was up near the top of the head. Yeah. So it's, it's got a little ball. Like a, it looks like a BB almost. Yeah. So yeah, I got one in my hand here. Actually on the head, it's got a little ball like molded into the head. So you can bend the top bar down just a little bit and it's going to head knock as well. Yeah. It's kind of like built in click and plus the rivet in the middle of the blade. You, you could probably see it on my screen a little bit here, but it's not compact, it's not giant, but it's almost all hook. It's almost like a booger man, but on steroids. And that, that old school booger man was awesome buzz bait. 
Are there any of those older lures out there that you think are just like disgustingly overrated? Yeah. I don't know if y'all are ready for this. And I've made a video on it. It's a wiggle wart. I was going to ask you, man. So I've got some of both. I've got some of the old pre rapla wiggle warts. I've got some of the storms. I got everything. Again, I'm like a, a nobody Midwestern guy where it's like I am in no way, shape, or form paying four or five times as much for a pre wrap as I am for a regular one. Now, uh, if you would have asked me about 10 years ago, I might not have said that, but technology has gotten really good. Baits are really good now. You've got Spro Rock Crawler out there. You've got the Curve 55 from Six Cents. You've got the Tekel, um, I think they call it the, the Drunker. Uh, Mega Bass has a kind of warp style bait. I don't see the need to pay those prices. And I'll be really honest with you, I've thrown OG warts. Uh, I've thrown the new ones. I can't tell much difference. Maybe it's where I live here on the Tennessee River where they just don't prefer that style. Saying that, if I'm going to Table Rock, Bull Shows, like the Ozarts, and it's early spring and there's a cranking bite, I will have some OG warts. But as far as nationally, I, I just think they're quite overrated. Well, I mean, like I have probably three or four of the old pre-wrap ones that got it on the bill and everything. And I bought the ones that like, cause I'm not going to pay crazy money. I bought the ones that like people sell on eBay as painters. And yeah. I, yeah, and I went out there and I fished them. I was so excited. I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to figure out what all this hype is about. I'm going to go out and I'm going to lean on some fish on an old school wart. And this is, I'm going to be like enlightened and I'll open Pandora's box. And this is why people have truckloads full of old warts and they hoard them. And I went out there and fished and I was like, I don't know, man. I wasn't like super blown away with it. Like yeah. when you hear those, all those old heads talk, they're like, oh, it hunts better. Like it hunts better than anything else. It's like, okay, well it's 98% the same side to side wiggle that you're getting with the new ones. It's like, it's not, it's not worth five times as much to me anyway. Yeah. Ben Milliken did a really good video of putting a bunch of them in a swimming pool and see which one did the best. I'll let y'all see the results yourself, but you'll be surprised. What all did he compare? Just the new and old I, ones or some other a, different brands? Uh, he did a new version. He did an old version. He did a company that kind of makes an old version. He did a rock crawler. He did two other ones. It's pretty interesting. It, and, you know, everything has its time and its place. But I just feel like there's people that really don't even fish that much. They've been, oh, you got to have OG Wiggle Wars. I really think as people know, people pay stupid prices for them. So they keep the hype trade going what are the i've seen them before are they dollar bill top waters what's the one that people go bonkers for and pay like make you want to puke money for well, i've got a norman top dollar is that what um, they are are those the ones that sell for crazy money there's I've some not sort seen of them sell for crazy money but oh, i know man. like the um paycheck baits Repo that's what man. it is yes yeah. so yeah, that's yeah. basically a barely lit that's basically the so you had the vixen came out and it was really popular, and they had the barely legal vixen, and, and they kind of got a little scarce there. Uh, you know, I know the details, but that's I don't want to put that on a podcast, it's not my yeah. business. So, um, and then all of a sudden, Bub Tosh uh comes out with paycheck bait, so they've got the uh, repo man, and then they got the smaller one. Uh, I forgot what it's called, but but they're both a top order just like the vixen. And so they're out for a couple of years, and then the Vixen comes back out, Gen 2, and all of a sudden, you can't get no paycheck baits or Vixens, and people are starting to pay silly money um, for the paycheck top orders. There's a repo man and the late payment. The small one's called the late payment. They had some other weird ones, too, like, like what was one called, a Sweaty Betty or something? They had, yeah, like, some... they had, they had weird names, uh, like Drag Strippers, Sweaty Betty. They had the um, one, I think. Yeah, then they had the one, which was really the first real popular pencil popper. Yeah, um, super skinny. You know, yep, so the Shower Blow, uh, the Berkeley Cane Walker, the I'm a Little Stick and Big Stick, they're really popular right now. You, lots of guys are talking about it. But really, the one from Paycheck and had these little feathers on the side, that was the first pencil popper that guys were like keeping hush-hush because, man, it caught a lot of fish. You could cast it really good in the wind. It was super loud. People will pay about 200 bucks for those and fish them, not collect them. They want to fish them. I just don't. I've tried to get into this whole like I've joined the mega bass forums and stuff like that. Yeah. And like tried to understand some of the affinity with some of these things. And you're, I think it is just it's like 
group think it's like mob mob rule yes. where it's like you see somebody want something and then it makes you want it and then you mm-hmm. get it in your hand and you're like oh it's like why did i pay <laughs> i don't know why did i pay this kind of money for this it's like yeah, you'll no. see the dudes chasing like a morning dawn 110 or something oh my and gosh. they'll like and they'll mortgage their house for this color of 110 that you could have some dude down the street paint for you and you almost wouldn't be able to tell the difference yes uh there is a every <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to single out mega bass, but they have a huge cult following. And sometimes I feel like, man, if they come out with a bait and said, if you'll ingest this, you'll catch more fish, people would do it. But it's not, and if it came into a respect series color, they'd line up for it. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it's not just mega bass. I mean, you got that with, uh, you know, even six cents, there's a big cult following of guys there. and, And that's okay. People are passionate about, their baits people are passionate about certain companies strike king has a huge following um even line i mean there's guys if you ch- say cigar is the best line they will straight up want to fight you because they're <laughs> die hard sunline but uh i do believe people get caught up in the hype uh a lot um i love mega bass they make awesome stuff i don't know anyone associated with any company that doesn't like them but they do put out some duds from time to time and I think some of that is because in Japan, it doesn't translate over to America. Same stuff that's made here sometimes does not translate over to Japan. So it, it's all about what you like and what you want to fish. Now, I know guys pay stupid money for those straight eye Vision 110s. That oh, yeah. Instead of the eye looking down, it's just a dot. Yep. I've got one, and I, I cannot tell a single bit of difference. Matter of fact, I've never caught a fish on it but I can throw, you know, Ito, Tennessee shad and I can catch them. And it's just a standard color. All right. We'll get back to our conversation with the bait man in just a second. But first this weekend, fall decided to do like a complete 180 on us up here in Ohio. The weather went from like 33 degrees to 78 degrees really quick. I was on the river for 10 hours on Sunday and I was sweating my tail off because it actually got hot. And you know what I'm glad I had with me? My Arctic Cooler. You guys know what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway because it needs to be ingrained into the brains of every budget-savvy angler out there. The best bang for your buck in coolers is Arctic Coolers. It's spelled R-T-I-C, and between their hard coolers, their soft coolers, their travel mugs, and their insulated bottles, they've got everything that you need for those fishing trips. My little 12-can soft cooler is an absolute beast in the kayak, and when I say soft cooler, this is not like a cheap lunchbox type material. This is a rigid premium cooler with sealing zippers, and it works just like their hard coolers. And right now, you can get 10% off and free shipping on your entire order of $50 or more by using code tackle talk all one word tackle talk at checkout that's 10 percent off and free shipping with code tackle talk at www.ricoutdoors.com keep the adventure going with arctic all right let's get back to our conversation with the bait man kevin baxter so speaking of colors are there any of those old colors whether it's normans or something like there were some really cool colors that i remember even as as me as a child that you just can't find anymore those really cool like brown craw type Mm -hmm. colors that used to be around all the time are there any colors that you look back on fondly that like if you see them in a store you see them somewhere you're like i'm gonna grab that yeah so obviously anything chartreuse and purple um they made a flat a um chartreuse purple coach dog i really really like um but Mort Menendez had several colors of Smithwick robes, and they don't make those colors anymore. Of course, they had a sour grape, but he had kind of a, a red shad. And it's got it's kind of white sides, blackish red pink back that's really, really good. He had a good blue back herring imitator. Um, those are, I think that one was called tequila shad, actually. Um I like those. If I find those, I grab them up because they don't make those in any of the new baits. Um, Bill Norman made a bunch of really good colors. I know Norman's not like, su- well, I don't want to say super popular, but it's not like if you're throwing DD-22s and stuff, people are kind of looking at you like, man, this guy know what he's doing. It's it's not the hot brand. But they were like the first company to do that gel coat. You know, everyone kind of had flat, matte colors, stuff like that. But Norman had those gel coat colors look like, you know, look like a bass boat. And uh, they had some old school colors in there. They have a chartreuse and blue that has some black flake in it. It's really hard to find. But in a deep little end or middle end, that color for some reason is money. 
And you cannot convince me that the regular chartreuse and blue is just as good. For some reason, when I had that one with those little speckles in it, I just felt more confident. And let's be honest, a confident fisherman usually catches more fish than someone that's not confident, whether it's in your rod, your reel, or the bait you're throwing. Um, you know, Bomber had a bunch of good uh, colors, too. They had a smallmouth bass color. They made it in like a, a 5A, a 6A. Um if I find those, I usually snatch them up. They, they come back out with it in the uh, Excalibur series bait in square bill. Um, I'll buy that one. For some reason, it's just really good natural color. You can get away with it. It looks like a brown crawfish, but they call it smallmouth bass. Um, I'm more usually just hunting a bait versus color, but there's a few colors I always try to grab. Are you one of those guys that likes the custom painted stuff or no, you stay away from I've had some custom painted jobs. I got a guy that lives really close to me. He does all Strike King stuff. Um, he, I'll let him paint some stuff, but I don't visit his house but once or twice a year. I I feel like custom painting is nice. It's cool. It's great to know someone that can do it. If a company discontinues a color, man, I really got to have that. You can get it done. But as far as my day in, day out fishing, Basically, every company offers something that I feel confident fishing with. At the at least for me, I'm a very very plain guy, and so when people talk to me about paint jobs and stuff, it's like, dude, I need a shad pattern, I need a black, I need a you know, mm-hmm. bream pattern of some sort, like chartreuse. Give me give me like my meat and potatoes four colors, and honest to goodness, that's all I need at the end of the day. Like I can buy all these stuffs and think they're really cool in the store, and then they sit in my box, and I throw a plain old gizzard shad looking crankbait all day long yeah uh you know i i got a tiktok account it's pretty horrible to be honest with you but i did a little tiktok because guys are always asking me about you know in top order what color what color do i need top order man if it ain't bone or if it ain't chrome just leave the rest at home now there's a time <laughs> there's a time and place for black and yeah, when that's i see the only that, other one i'd add yeah. And when I say bone or chrome, I don't mean everything's got to be bone and solid bone or solid chrome. If you're in your local store and they've got something with bone sides and a you know yellow top, that's a good one. If they got something that's chrome, blue back, that's fine. Um, but my base colors in the fall or pretty much any any time top order is pretty much going to be a bone or a chrome base. And you can have whatever on top or on the sides, but as long as that belly in parts of the sides or those two colors, you're, you're going to be fine. Everybody's got that one magical color, whether it's me and chartreuse purple. I know some people that swear by Tennessee shad in the spring, they got to have Rayburn red or, you know, dirty water. You got to have your chartreuse and black crankbait. I totally get that. We all find that niche, you know, zoom worm watermelon with blue flake and gold sparkles, man, that's the one. You know, my dad, 72 years old, you cannot convince him there's another color besides red shad. Uh, but that's the cool thing about fishing. We can all kind of have our favorites and our non-favorites. Usually we can get along. Sometimes we can't. But <laughs> Well, it's funny you say that, too. My my confidence color, honest to goodness, is probably black. Like, it is. I will throw black topwaters. I will throw black spinnerbaits. I have a bunch of black, like, 1.0s and 1.5s. Like, I throw... Because we... And it depends on where you live, too. We live in a place where our water is so dirty and so gross all the time that my confidence to me is, like, I just want contrast. Like, I want... I want there, it makes me feel better at least. I don't know if it makes a bit of difference at all for the fish, but for me, contrast makes me think, all right, in a, in a murky water situation, I like my chances of giving that fish a dark silhouette to see versus any other color. But it's like, you'll talk to the same people, be right beside me and they'll be throwing chartreuse or they'll be throwing Mm -hmm. silver or chrome or they'll be throwing a sexy shad or whatever. Like it doesn't matter. It's all confidence. Like you said. Yeah, I'll be honest. I, I, this year, I've caught several fish on a black square bill and a black lipless. And I think there's something to that. Uh, when you talk about the silhouette, it's totally different than anything else. And I was actually fishing it in pretty clear water. And I wouldn't get a whole lot of bites on my reds or my shad patterns. I started, you know, I picked up a black uh, lipless that Six Cents makes. And, dude, I caught fish on the second cast. I'm like, okay. Then I caught another one. Then I caught another one. I'm like, all right, there's something to this. And you know, I'm not a biologist. I'm just a guy that goes out and goofs off and plays with tons of baits. And I really feel like that silhouette in clear water, it, it, it's different. Like, it goes by them so fast. And if you ever watch a fish in really clear water, their backs look black, almost brown. You know, it's not like 
you know, it's green bass and there you, you see a little bit of silhouette to them. Yep. Um, before we get to some specific lures here too, my last question, big questions. I know you're a big balsa guy. You like balsa crankbaits. You like oh, yeah. balsa lures. What are your favorite go-to? And do you have any current ones that you really, really like? Like I know obviously Rappel has made kind of a splash past yeah. couple of years with the OG series. You've got Bagley out there. You've got some folks mm-hmm. that are doing – balsa's weird because balsa is one of those things that I think of more of like a – guy taking his time and making it in his garage and that's the good stuff but there are mm-hmm. a couple companies that are mass producing it now yeah uh so I, I really got into the boss deal here about five or six years ago uh that's a facebook deal um uh, i'd be bored and i start seeing all these beautiful baits i'm like man I, I i'm gonna join this group and i started throwing them more and more and i've always thrown like the old bagley's you know the killer b1 that's a legendary one uh, the way it comes through cover and everything and you remember we'll talk a hero on a classic on uh balsa b2 i believe it was um so they still have their time and place um bagley probably the most well-known company that mass produces them i like the old school ones that are made down there in florida if you ever find one you'll know the package is like white and got red yellow and black bars on it you turn around say it's made in florida um and then rapala always has made balsa baits and i'm a big fan of the dt16 i'll tell anyone straight to the face one more money on a chartreuse and blue dt16 than any other crankbait i've got combined i don't always throw it anymore uh, number one our bass for some reason i can take away they don't need a crankbait much anymore but in its prime that dt16 the way we fish cranking brush and stumps it's a whole lot different action than an abs plastic bait hitting it it just you know or like an xd or something yeah yeah they back up like you can hit a stump and they'll back up and you can kind of worm it through the brush like the old school anglers know about worming a a a killer b1 bagley over stumps it just backs up and you just move your rod tip and get that bait to that's what those repels do but now you got the og series of baits uh, I really like the slims. Not a huge fan of the hooks, um, but you know, for a mass-produced boss bait, they run really good, and you can cast them really well. And that makes a huge difference because if you're a new guy to the boss scene and you go out there and you can't cast it, you're going to get frustrated and you're not going to want to fish it. Whereas the Rapala, the OG Slim Six, it's a really good casting bait. So a new guy can get that and be really confident in that because. The time of the year when you throw those baits, it's usually really windy. All right. I want you to give me your brutally honest opinion on, let's see, I wrote down one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of my favorite baits. Okay. And I want I want your your 100% unedited opinion on my favorite baits of all time. Are these really your favorites or are these ones that you're trying to get some clicks from? No. When I, okay. Anybody that, anybody that listens to the show will like probably be nauseous at the amount of times I've mentioned all of these baits at some point over the past three years. Sure. Um, all right. First Husky jerks. I don't throw them, but I respect them. Okay. Yeah. How's that for an answer? It's like a, it's a working man's jerk bait. Yeah. It's like a, yeah. I don't know. I think of it as like, it's, it's still kind of a, around here. It's a hybrid walleye saw guy bass jerk bait. It's, Dude, it's, it's super but, popular. Rapala sells thousands of them every year. Yeah. And there's six bucks. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. KVD 1.5. Uh, as far as square bills, probably one of the most popular ones. You don't have to worry too much about buying them and they're not running. They all run pretty good. I think it's the best square bill that Strike King makes. Um, it's super versatile. You can fish it in three foot of water. You can fish around riprap, stumps, around brush, around boat docks. It's a really good bait. And there's so many colors. I don't know how you could just say well i can't find a a 1.5 in the color i like i promise you strike king's got it the old before power bait havoc pit bosses Ooh, extremely underrated uh amazing flipping bait um i've got some power bait ones and i like the havoc ones a little bit better yeah me too yeah, I'm one of those guys that like if I see them now they're in uh, Ollie's because yes. they they got bought out by obviously the they're not making them anymore so they're now in like all of the discount stores but Ollie's around here has them so whenever I see them I stock up. <laughs> um, all right, Smithwick Rogues suspending yeah. like the just the regular suspending rogue. The OG Smithwick Rogue probably the best jerk bait ever made and 
put it out there. So many bass caught on that Smithwick Rogue. It's just, you know, there's something about the roll to that thing. It's got, you know, a mega bass tends to dart, uh, Smith, uh, six cents provoke and lucky craft corner. They tend to dart left and right really hard. They don't roll a lot. That old rogue has some roll to it. So that's where your the color you got really makes a difference because it's either going to flash, you know, really bright white or flash that chrome. And bass are visual feeders, especially in spring. A jerk bait's one of the few baits that bass will come to. It's kind of like an A rig in a glide bait. Most of the time when you're fishing, you're trying to go to the bass. Whereas now with forward facing sonar, people see this more. A bass will come chase a jerk bait. And a lot of times it's that flash, it draws them in. So I love a rogue. Great choice. Yeah. I've probably caught a surprising number of fish in my entire life. Like if I would total up my totals on like a purple darter, the silver with like the little orange and black that they have, like your standard color, and then a clown. Yeah. I've caught I've so many fish on a clown rogue that it's ridiculous. Yeah, I, uh, I love that old color. It's called nuclear clown. You remember the red yes. just kept dripping off the head a little bit. That is a really good one. Yeah. Um, all right, Rico's. Love a Rico. Uh, as far as, you know, popper, uh, it's probably in my top three. Uh, I've got one that's just, abs- it was a bone color, but it had like a pearl finish over it. And I don't see it very often, but is it's it's like Matt now. I've caught so many fish on it. I'll just, <laughs> I just change the hooks every year. What are okay? I'm getting off topic here, but what are your other two poppers? Uh, a, a, a P70. You know, I just had Craig Powers on the stream, but that big P70 is really good um, because you, you can let it with the right amount of slack in your line. It will just sit there in one spot, go back, back and forth, and uh, not to sound like a total total sponsor ho but dude i've really had good luck with the six cent splashback um it's got a little bit more walking action than many other poppers uh but it's the right size i like that 70 it's really good and it casts really good and uh i've been able to put that bait in some really tight windows that some other poppers i can't but man i like a popper and uh that, that'd be my top three right there the six cent splashback was the very first six cent bait i ever bought um, I bought the black one with like the neon green eyes and the blue kind of like accents on it. And it, they are, they're cool poppers because most of the poppers you see obviously are very rounded cylindrical. It's almost like triangular shaped yeah. where it, it's got this like a uh, hull, I guess, where it comes down to under the water and then it's got this fatter, flatter back mm-hmm. on it. A really cool kind of popper design. Um, okay. Christy crawls. Uh, if Christy Craw probably wouldn't be in my top 10 craw, craw baits. Um, Young makes good stuff. Uh, there's stupid underrated products, but um, I'm not a big fan of Christy Craw. Christy Craws are one of those things where I think it was just me growing up using them because we had a Walmart. That was like all we had. That's where you yeah. could buy your your baits and Christy Craws were always there when I was like, I probably, I don't, I'm not a, not a little kid, but a little older. But it was just one of those things where it's like I had confidence in it. I threw it on the back of every jig I ever threw. And it was like a, a poor man's back in the day rage crawl where it was like it kicks right. pretty pretty hard for a cheap little crawl, but uh, skinny enough that I could throw it on like a finesse jig and still get away with it. Where that was a problem with some of the big old crawls that you'd find, especially back in the day at Walmart. They were like these big fat things. And you're like, it's yeah. not what I want on the back of a little finesse jig around here. Yeah, I mean, we went through this phase where you remember the madman crawls. Yeah. That looked just gimmick. <laughs> I bought yeah. a bunch of gimmick. Yep. Okay, another crawl. Uh net baits packet crawl. Dude, uh, I don't think the pack of crawl gets enough credit for what it did in the fishing industry. So I remember when the pack of crawl came out and the tackle shop I was working in the in the cabin, we had probably the biggest selection of net bait in the country. There would be pros driving to other tournaments. I remember Jason Quinn stopped in, and I don't know how much it was total. I just remember he was on his second ba- basket of pack of crawls, and he hit like seven hundred dollars. I'm like, dude, are you serious? He said, I want them all. He said, I'd buy them all. I'd buy every one of them if I had enough cash on me. He said, I'm just going to pay in cash. I'm like, I don't care how you pay, you know. <laughs> But you think of the pack of crawl comes out, then you had the chigger crawl, the rage crawl. Now everybody's got 
a craw that's got some oversized pinchers that kind of undulate back and forth as it falls down. And thanks to Netbait for that. Now, they really sparked that. Uh, War Eagle spinnerbaits. So I like a War Eagle. Uh, really like the Screaming Eagle. I like burning spinnerbaits, especially in the fall. The regular double wheels, I believe, are a little bit underrated. I know as far as you hear War Eagle a lot, but I've caught a lot of big fish slow rolling a, a half ounce or three quarter uh, standard size War Eagle in the spring. Really good bait. Sometimes people kind of dog on the hook, say it's a little undersized, but the thing about that hook is when you get them, you really, really get them. Uh, good bait. I've used a few of the new ones that are, are not made in the U.S. I can't tell much of a difference. The one that I usually use most times is a 3 8 ounce, just a double willow, and it's the, I think they call it Patriot, but yeah. it's like, a, it's supposed to be red, white, and blue, but when you look at it in the water, it's like that perfect little speckled crappie pattern kind of look to it. Yeah, so they're like one of the first spinnerbait companies that really kind of, Everybody made a chartreuse or a white or chartreuse and white, but man, they come out. They had so many different colors. They had, you know, I think they firecracker. They had that's what it is. Firecracker, coleslaw. not patriot. Yeah, they had, you know, blue glimmer, green glimmer. They had a cotton candy. They had something for everybody. But that mouse color, that's like the gray with the green flake. Several years ago, on Lake Barkley, that was the deal. If you weren't throwing that mouse color, you weren't getting bit. There's it's really like a bluegill pattern, you know, but War Eagle was kind of revolutionary in the fact that they weren't afraid to put some wild colors out there and they caught fish. And last one I've fell in love with the past couple of years is, well, when it came out, I think it was two years ago, um, the Head and Super Spook Boyo. Yeah, so I've thrown that. Actually, Junior's thrown that bait. He likes that bait a lot. So I'm always a big Spook fan. You cannot go wrong. If you're wanting a top order bait to buy anything heading, I, you know, super spook junior, big spook, one knocker. The boyo works really good. So junior throws that thing on like 12 pound braided line and uh, he can make it walk pretty good. Sometimes he don't know what he's doing, but he can make it walk very well. It's a really good bait. And I'm surprised more companies haven't kind of went to trying to make a smaller. That size. Walk. Yeah. That's a really good size, whether you're a pond angler, your river angler or you live a place where big fish is because you just don't see that many small walking baits that walk really well. And that one does a great job. Yeah. It's got a much tighter walk to it that versus the other guys that are out there throwing the exact same, the normal super spooks. It's like that fish is seen a thousand times, like just a tiny little bit difference in that walk cadence makes a difference. I think for me, um, Okay, so now those were my favorite. I have some different categories. I want to ask you if you have to pick one, gun okay. to your head, one of each of these baits that you have to throw, you know, rest of your life here. Um, square bill. Uh, square bill for the rest of my life. Is, does that include boss or not? Yeah, it can be anything. As long as it's got a square bill. Man, I really like uh, Jimmy Eater makes a, they call it a grind 1.5 square bill. It is amazing. I would throw that the rest of my life. Deep diver. I think you probably already answered this, but. Dude, Rapala DT-16. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Buzzbait. Buzzbait, as much as I like that uh, squeaky dolphin, they're hard to get, and I'd be afraid I've only got one. Um, there's one from a company. It's called a Chatterbuzz. It's really, really good. I also put a War Eagle buzz bait, a close, close second. I've caught some really big fish on a War Eagle buzz bait. The one thing about it, they put a bigger blade on it. And so when you want it to go slow and cold weather, they just absolutely chew that thing. So uh, Walking bait. Walking bait. Um, vixen. Fair. Popper. Popper. Um, I know you answered your three, but which one? Oh, man. I would probably go with the Rico. I just, it, as much as I like the P70, uh, the Rico is just a little bit more versatile. What about a swim jig? Dude, that six cent swim jig's bad to the bone. I knew uh, that's what you were going to say. <laughs> yeah, dude. It, it, <laughs> there's some really good swim jigs on the market, uh, but day in, day out, I, that six cent one with the, the screw lock and the way the head design on it, it just catches fish. What about a flipping jig? Flipping jig. Dude, I'll go. Uh, Oldham's. So Oldham's screw lock flipping jig. It's an old school jig. A lot of pros use it. Supposedly that's where the hack attack jig come from, but it's a really, really good jig made down there in South Texas. And it's kind of one of those, if you know, you know. Interesting. Still being made, I'm assuming. Yeah. 
you got to order them from Terry Odom himself. And you can find them in some tackle shops, especially around Texas and Arkansas. They carry them. Got it. Uh, Joining the swim bait. Bullshad. Yeah. Which one? Uh, I like the eight inch uh, okay. slow sink. And I tell guys this all the time. If you're buying a swim bait, whether it's a six cents, um, a, a bull shad, and they've got options that are floating, slow sink, or fast sink, I tend to go with the slow sink because if I want it to sink faster, you can always put uh, some, some, you can always wait it. If you buy a fast sink, you can't make it rise. So, um, frog, frog, ooh. Jackal Gavacho. That's one of my favorite frogs of all time. And I've caught a lot of fish on it. It's a really, really good frog. Dude, this is what I love. Like if I ask 90% of people around here, they'd be like, Pad Crasher. It's like, no, I'm going to Jackal now, Gavacho. Now, obviously, I'm not basing my list on best bang for your buck. Because Well, I right. Would, no, this is forever. Yeah. Yeah. Forever. It's it's the Gavacho. Uh, what about a bladed jig? Bladed jig, jackhammer. I mean, Back in the day, you know, I always liked the old school gambler ones. They're hard to get, but it's, in my opinion, there's no other bladed jig. It's a jackhammer. What about just a regular EWG worm hook? Man, I don't get too caught up on that stuff. I don't really throw EWGs a lot. I throw... Uh, just, straight shank most time? Yeah, I've gotten in this straight shank kick the last couple of years, but I like an owner. They call it a 5191. It's really hard to find. It's a really good worm hook. What about just plastic crawl in general? Uh, dude, I've always got a soft spot for sweet beaver. Like, I caught my PB on a green goby sweet beaver several years ago on a Lake Barkley. It was like nine pounds, four ounce. So anytime I go flipping, I'm always going to have one tied on. And then the last one, this is a big one. The bait man's favorite worm of all time. Favorite worm of all time is actually pretty easy because I'm staring at about, <laughs> about 40 packs of these. Uh, it's made from a company called Lucky Strike. Um, they're still around. It's called the Original Ringer in Plum, 9-inch. It's what Marizo Shimizu won the Kentucky Lake Derby on in like 2003. Uh, he was yelling, oh, big mama, big mama. You look in that video. He's got that plum ringworm hanging out of that fish's mouth. But that's been, well, I like to call the brick cone worm, local angler here. He made that thing famous, and it's unreal how good that worm is offshore. It's got rings on it. It's got a nice ribbon tail. They're not durable. Literally, one fish, it's done. Um, no one's ever been able to, like, truly replicate it. Lake Fork tried, and it was decent. Um, you know, six cents makes the divine shaky worm and it's got ribs all down it, but it doesn't have a ribbon tail. It's really good, but dude, you can have all my tackle except for my bosses. As long as I can have them ringworms, I'll feel good. See, I've seen them before. I know what you're talking about. It, it is. It's like a, what we call like around here, like a ring fry worm, but it's got yeah. a giant, it's got giant curly tail in the end. Are they super limp or are they yeah, so firmer? Like, if I grab one out of the package, it's just like, you can sque- roll it up in your hand, like. And then you let go and it pops out. But when you put it, when you hook it up, there's not a lot of plastic for that hook to go through. It's just the core of the worm and then the rings. So you can kind of hide the point of the hook in one of those rings, but you're fishing it through a brush power or whatnot, it comes through pretty good. But when a bass bites it, I mean, it's like instant hook. Well, cool. Um, before we let you go, obviously, I know I kept you a little bit longer than I said I would, but um, you can keep me as long as you want. <laughs> before we let you go, where can folks keep up with everything that you're doing if they want to watch and listen to more? Like, obviously, we scratched the tiniest little surface of baits, and if you go watch one of your videos, you will dive ten thousand times down the the rabbit hole more than we do. Where can folks find him? Yeah, so uh, my YouTube channel is the Baitman TV. Um, you just searching in youtube you'll see all this thumbnails come up uh instagram i try to keep everything really streamlined i'm big on instagram i do a lot of little live stuff on there i like to make of reels i I have a love hate relationship with reels like there's some really awful content and i hate to get on a tangent uh i try to put quality stuff up there but um it's baxter the bait man and then uh, I've got a TikTok, same thing, Baxter the Bait Man. And then I, you can look me up on Facebook. I think it might be the Bait Man Baxter or something like that. So I try to keep those pretty fresh. Really, my Facebook 
it's the same stuff I put on Instagram. It just goes to a totally different audience. Um, I don't do a lot of TikToks. I don't take it too serious. I try to be funny. Well, thanks, man. Hey, I appreciate it a ton. Thanks for stopping by. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our conversation with the bait man, Kevin Baxter. Dude, I appreciate it. All right, everybody. That was our conversation with the bait man himself. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Go check out his YouTube channel, The Bait Man TV. If you type in bait man, it'll pop right up. He's been around forever. If you're a tackle nerd, if you are someone that likes to expand your knowledge a little bit about what's out there, maybe not even new stuff, just stuff that's out there that you could find on eBay that you may have never even heard of or wouldn't have heard of if it wasn't for Kevin, go check him out. His stuff is good. So thank you guys so much for listening. As always, it means a ton if you can go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify if you haven't already. That helps a ton. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite platform so you don't miss an episode, and we will see you right back here next Tuesday for another brand new episode of Tackle Talk. Thank you for listening to the Tackle Talk Podcast. Tackle Talk is produced by Andrew Hayes. Copyright 2021. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts.